the British um, minister, Enoch Powell, back in the 50s, it was a conservative government. He said he was going to import drugs to, from Italy to make them cheaper. Then all of a sudden, their own company, Glaxo, Burles Welcome, and some Swiss companies, Shiba and others, they all said, no, 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 that's not a good idea. This actually makes money, so don't do that. So this is a, uh, this adds to the, uh, national, it's a national asset. And the United States, the same thing. Canada had none of these things. But Canada just goes along anyway. Always pretending that we too are making money. We, we know we make no money. We have no industry. We have no research um, uh, of our own. It's a small little country. We, we don't have any o- o- our own pharmacopoeia. We just uh, take uh, whatever comes from wherever. That's, that's the nature of the small country. And these uh, things went on and on and on. And in Canada, the name Food and Drugs Directorate, even in 1971, was changed to Health Protection Branch to soften it. In other words, you're not going to direct any companies. You're just going to be Health Protection Branch, and the, uh, and then they appointed an assistant deputy minister, and he said, we'll do good science. In other words, we won't uh, need to, we'll work with the companies. That set the uh, standard right from there that we are going to dilute regulations. This went on and on. We come into the 80s and then Reagan administration comes. We know uh, what happened under President Reagan. It was open policy to deregulate everything, deregulate airline industries, deregulate bridges, and deregulate everything. But the big deregulation that nobody talks about, perhaps people don't know, don't recognize what that meant. Deregulation in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, that's uh, the most dangerous thing that started to happen during President Reagan's time. And President Reagan and uh, um, Vice President Bush both came to Canada in 1984 and our Prime Minister at that time um, um, uh, Brian Mulroney uh, and a huge contingent of the pharmaceutical industry all came to Quebec City and they were singing one evening Irish eyes and this is now the glorious United States, Canada free trade agreement and all that but behind it was uh, the pharmaceutical industry song. This is the era when also began quite silently genetic engineering. Genetic engineering initially was um, due to someone discovering in the United States that they could uh, take a bacteria, E. coli, genetically modify that bacteria and make it or eat petroleum oil. And the proposal he made, this scientist used to work for uh, General Electric. He went to patent the uh, this bacteria, E. coli bacteria. And, of course, he was denied. The fear was that if this bacteria gets out and gets into the oil wells, what will we do? Will all the oil wells will dry up. So, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was they said we need to set up regulations. What are those regulations? As the regulations they were setting up, I went to some of those meetings, uh, genetic engineering, and I thought they were um, scientific meetings. But there were more li- lawyers in, in those meetings, telling, uh, teaching people how to. Uh, apply for patents and how to write things uh, rather than talk science. There was nobody talking about science. It was all patenting living forms uh, and uh, their products. Now, the United States is the only country in the world even now that actually allows patenting of bacteria or living uh, organisms and their products. And Eli Lilly took human insulin and they produced it from E. coli, which was probably a good thing that um, you don't have to take um, uh, pig insulin 
so people was getting some reactions and so forth. But but having done that, they just abolished. No more pig insulin was available, but this became the only. And they went and bought out every company all over the world trying to do the same thing. So there was a monopoly that Eli Lilly produced on human insulin. Here comes Monsanto. Monsanto had the idea, actually there were four companies, that we will now produce a hormone, bovine growth hormone, recombinant, genetically modified, similarly in E. coli, and then uh, injections of that hormone will be given to um, cows to produce, um, to increase milk production. Well, Pfizer and Cyanamid, American uh, Cyanamid, American, uh, American Cyanamid, pulled out, but only two companies remained behind. Those were Monsanto and Eli Lilly. Now, the two had a fight. They went to court. As they went to court, they um, Eli Lilly wanted to sell it as well, but Monsanto beat them to it because the U.S. also ruled by policy that for genetically modified organisms, there would be only one patent and whoever comes first gets it and nobody else can apply. This is supposed to be free enterprise, the great America. So the, that patent for RBGS in the United States was awarded to Monsanto. And uh, Eli Lilly is not going to be outdone, so they come to Canada. In Canada, they said, we want to test our product. Well, lo and behold, this is 1988. This is the time I changed my job from the human prescription drugs to the Bureau of Veterinary Drugs. I happened to be a veterinarian and uh, licensed veterinarian. And go by going there, I could increase my salary by a few thousand dollars. And so that was the only reason what I, uh, why I went there. I was 54 years of age. I thought I was going to take early retirement at 60. That was my plan. <laughs> there I go, and on the first first submission that lands on my desk is an investigational new drug from Eli Lilly, one of his subsidiaries, on RBGS. And my colleagues were saying, well, it's the same as a natural. We don't, don't need to ask any questions. The recommendation was just pass it. I said, you can't pass it. You have to ask questions. It's, it, it's uh, genetically modified. He said, well, it's the same as a uh, cow's own. I said, it doesn't matter. Even if you took natural BST, BGH, and you gave injections of it, it could harm the cow. And ultimately, the, the, it might come out in the milk. Something else may happen. People are going to drink that milk. And they kept on arguing. I said, can you give insulin when it's not needed to people? Because you'll kill people if you give it more than what's necessary. I used the same argument. And he said, well, what test can we do? I said, well, normal test. This is a growth hormone. If you inject it in some animals, rats, we, we should find out whether it produces some other hormones. For instance, it, it could affect the uh, uh, pancreas. There could be more insulin. There could be more progesterone. There could be more thyroxine. This is normal thing for a veterinarian to ask because, you know, veterinarians are effectively toxicologists. Uh, unlike the medical people, we learn comparative medicine. So, therefore, this is the way to compare and see what species do. And the law is that every drug, uh, any product that directly or indirectly gets into the human body must be tested in at least two species of animals, one of which must be non-rodent. And then it also must be tested in pregnant animals. Then it also must be tested whether it produces cancer for by lifetime studies in rats and mice and so forth. None of these uh, studies had been done on, on uh, the bovine growth hormone. So anyway, the um, product sat there unapproved. And then we also saw when this was actually given to cows, it was producing double bursts in cows. 
and the hooves were elong- getting elongated, the hair was, the horns were, the joints were swollen. And they said, well, don't worry about the cow. We're only concerned about the milk, so don't worry about the cow safety. And here was my questions about the uh, rat safety, uh, the human safety aspect of it. So, you see, this went on and on, and ultimately, I dug my heels in. My colleagues uh, also did the same thing, and uh, we filed um, complaints, grievances against our department that we are being pressured to pass drugs of questionable safety. And uh, this pressure is coming from the highest offices of the Canadian government. That include the Prime Minister, the Privy Council, the, the highest officers. And uh, uh, com- companies can pressure us, but our own bosses. We want to receive promotions. People, non-technical people, accountants, lawyers, all kinds of people um, uh, were appointed as our bosses, and who wouldn't want to listen? And MBAs, and uh, you know, th- that was the style. Uh, MBAs can buy science, and scientists don't know how to manage science. That was the trend. It all came out of Harvard, uh, idea of how to manage uh, 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 scientific areas, health areas. And that is part of the corruption that began a long time ago. It, 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 it was triggered out of the United States, particularly, uh, you know, Harvard model. Everybody has to be an MBA. And uh, doctors are sidelined, the scientists are sidelined, engineers are sidelined. So safety issues come and ignore it. it, it it'll be those uh, accountants and MBAs uh, who'll make the decisions. So yet, so we couldn't do anything about it. So we filed complaints. This, because we filed the complaints through our union, it became public. When it became public, the farmers of Canada, the public of Canada, they all were complaining about RBGH. Somehow this now got their attention and I, with my colleagues, we were hauled before the Canadian Senate. And this is where the first spillage of information occurred uh, uh, before it became very public and public inquiry. Finally, RBGH was not approved in Canada. The U.S. approved it where it is still approved. It is still approved in the United States. U.S. is now the only major country where it's approved. Mind you, uh, a lot of people now uh, object to it. And the U.S. FDA insists that people can even label that it's RBST free because it, it does um, um, disservice to Monsanto or whoever. Now Monsanto has sold this product to Eli Lilly. Imagine uh, they weren't making money, so they sold it to Eli Lilly, one after the other. And when I before went before, the, I mean, I was. Uh, not uh, it, it, the word is invited, but it, it's like a subpoena. When the Senate invites you, that means you better go. If you refuse, you can go to jail. And uh, so you have to go. Um, so anyway, to cut the long story short, um, we were hauled before the Senate and a report that I had written and the department said, now speak from it, but we have removed chapters from it because it is confidential information belonging to Monsanto and Eli Lilly. Imagine, this is a free country. We are serving the public interest. The whole issue involves the public. And the department is saying this information is proprietary information. It belongs to um, a company. So therefore, you can't speak from your own report. Anyway, after a lot of fights, eventually the report was brought before the Senate And uh, so we were able to talk from there. The Senate got very concerned. They started to, they asked me, is this the only drug or are there others uh, in your department? I said, sir, since you ask, so I named a whole list of drugs, antibiotics, hormones, and various things. And, um, And as I came back, the department put a gag order on me and they suspended me for 